Well, chapter four, welcome to chapter four, uh, working with parents. Uh, learning objectives here, uh, important concepts about educational settings, the least restrictive environment continuum, of placements, uh, different uh, educational settings, collaborative partnerships, and learning disabilities in the families. So let's uh, move on here. Uh, two concepts. This is the the key is this placement, this setting, and this is what we talk about is settings or placements, and uh, two considerations. Obviously, the LRD, the least restrictive environment, and you're familiar with that to, that term that we've used it quite a bit here. But a new term to you is continuum a continuum of, of alternative placements and that needs to be part of vocabulary uh, in the special ed world just like LRE a continuum of alternative placements or a continuum of placements okay and more landmark lawsuits over this than just about anything else in special education that is what will be the setting and on uh, Contrary to what you would think, most of the lawsuits are about wanting a more restrictive environment. Now, what does that mean? That means parents suing to have their child in a special school someplace to get special training and have the school pay for it. And often it's a, it's a big... Uh, it's a big financial burden on the school and as a consequence uh, they fight it they hesitate and they challenge it but the parents have the right to ask for that and that's a very assertive uh, a stance to take one thing this chapter doesn't do a very good job of and that is preparing you to work with the other kind of parents that's very passive that doesn't want to be involved that feels overwhelmed and so they tend to disappear or stay stay vacant. So let's look at this uh, this um, LRE. LRE is uh, to the maximum extent appropriate. So you need to be familiar with that term. term. What is LRE? It's to the maximum extent appropriate. Students are educated with their peers without disabilities. Okay, and so just like continuum that is jargon that you'll need to be familiar with especially this thing of maximum extent appropriate and maybe the highlight here is maximum and then what is the term inclusion it's a philosophy based on the belief that all children with disability have a right to participate in the environment in general education peers, starting point of general education class, and you know that. Okay, so what is the philosophy of inclusion? Let me jump over here. Here's the restricted environment. So peers do not have disabilities to the greatest extent appropriate. So there it is. So that's the cornerstone of this inclusion movement. So here, here's the thing of inclusion, and this is what it looks like. And I'm going to have you bring this into your um, wiki. But here, look at notice this side here. So 53% uh, of 53.7% uh, of kids identified as having a learning disability uh, are in the regular classroom at least 80% of the time. So it's, as you can see in the pie, a little more than half. Then the next biggest group are considered to be uh, 79%. The regular class, 79% uh, or less, are 40 to 79%. That's 23%. And then here, 17% are uh, considered to be in the regular class um, less than 40% then this is the one uh, other environments that tends to be what we uh, argue and haggle about and have lawsuits. So that's that group. 
So what is this philosophy of education? Philosophy of inclusion, I mean, what is the philosophy? And I want you, I'm going to make this number one. Here is you write a piece about that, about this philosophy of inclusion that comes from here. And it's, here's a big part of it. An argument for inclusion is that successful adults with disabilities have learned to function comfortably in society and in the community in an unrestricted environment composed of all people. So that's what uh, the underlying part of this is. And it goes back to what is that maximum amount appropriate for them to be with the regular kids in school and in the classrooms. Okay. And then mainstreaming is another mentality and mainstreaming is this. Students with disabilities are placed selectively in the general ed classrooms with the starting point being the special ed class. All right. And then guidelines for effective inclusion looks like this. bring these in here on uh, page those four things and so we're going to call this uh, number two okay, guidelines uh, for effective instruction and then here's the strategies uh, of this And for this changes here in placement, I'm going to jump you over here uh, to these uh, also. Um, and I'm going to call this uh, number four or number three. And you just write something, uh, a narrative for each one of those uh, from here. And as usual, don't bring all this, just uh, kind of a bridge version, a synopsis of each of these about making this change. And that'll be number three here. Okay. And here's that continuum, and let's take a look at that. These changes of placement, and here's the placements. Uh, again, a continuum. Uh, can you just say that word out loud right now? Continuum of alternate placements. Go ahead. Okay, good job. So here they are, and uh, it takes you through. Here's a, a thing, and again, I'm going to give you this uh, to bring in your wiki, but what I'm going to have you do is look at these. First of all, the case for this continuum, and that's up a little farther. And here's the case, and I'm going to uh, um, uh, uh, switch these around. So here's the case for continuum, why you need these, uh, and it lays these out real well for you. Um, let me just give you these uh, here, and this is going to be number four. And that's where you address each of these. So here's the case. The students with disability needs intense teaching in small groups, so you uh, you need each of these. And so you, you bring a, a, a quick synopsis of what each of these uh, mean. General and special educators should work together. Many parents and paraprofessionals worry that many of their needs of learning disabilities and related cannot be met in inclusion. Many students and learning disabilities and related need individualized instruction and intense teaching. Empirical research does not identify one thing. So uh, generally we accept that the best place always is in the regular classroom, but the case for this continuum is that's not true. And you'll get that right here uh, a synopsis for each of those. And then this uh, continuum of placement and what each of these mean. And so let's let's look at those. These different types of educational and this is what you would consider severity, the need of the related services and those types of things. And here it goes through those placements again where these students are. So here's these continuums, these different environmental things.
So let's look at these environmental options, which is a, a, a twang way of saying it. What it's talking about is this continuum, and that they're down here. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing, is write a synopsis for each of these of, number one, what they are, and number two, what... Uh, when how you would when you would choose these and it does a pretty good job of laying these out okay when and why you do each and you get down here uh, these are a lot more intensive one on one homebound hospital uh, residential facility when would you need those and this would be uh, your number five and again not all of it but so you have an understanding and can speak intelligently of this continuum of alternative placements and why we need all those okay and I'm missing the last one down here you add this one the one-on-one -on -one. okay so we go into this. So what about this collaboration and working with kids in the general ed? Because we know that most of the kids that will be served will be in their regular classroom. So what is this? what about this partnership? So a greater number of students with learning disabilities and related mild disabilities receive their instruction in general education. And you knew that too. This is not new to you. Uh, and promote partnerships between these two classrooms. So what does that mean to us? Well, what is collaboration? That you have these things, these mutual goals, voluntary participation, those times, uh, those things. Okay. So collaboration, what is needed, here they are, here, one, two, three, four, five, six things. And so that will be uh, number six here. That you bring those in there. So what does the general ed teacher need? And here they are to participate in the IEP, to reduce the class size, uh, reduce uh, time for planning with you, uh, paraprofessionals, some help in the classroom, maybe volunteers, collaboration with special educator, uh, continuum. Some students with special needs will require more inclusive than general education classroom. So they need to know that there is an option, okay, availability of related professionals and opportunity for learning. So here, that is going to come in here. And this will be number seven. And again, you, uh, just a synopsis for each of those. And then what about you? What does a special education teacher need? Have a, a number of these things also. And let's take a look at those. You need collaboration time, planning time, uh, uh, competency skills and, and how to do it, the competencies and human relationships with, the, uh, with those other teachers. And these here, I'm going to make number eight. You bring these eight things in, and again, in kind of a, a synopsis, and we're going to put those down here of what you need. Participate in the IEP, uh, things you'd imagine. Then there's a piece here on co teaching. Two or more teachers deliver instruction to a diverse group of students in a general education setting. And so that's uh, here also. And I'm going to have this pop up. And you have this in your textbook. And you go through these, again, with a synopsis of what each of these are. If their child is born with a disability, um, 
they have some of the same struggles. Parenting with a child with a disability is challenging, but it can also be rewarding. Parents need support from the school, extended family, professionals, those uh, no simple solutions. Uh, here's a bunch of stories. Uh, please read through these. You'll get an underlying attitude of uh, it falling on families. So here is uh, for for parents playing this crucial role. So here's your first one. I'm just going to run these out here. So this will be number. So this will be number 11 here, and a synopsis of that, and then providing a parent with understanding of the rights, different suggestions for parents. And the suggestion for parents, I'm going to jump up here and call this number 12 and you give a synopsis for each of these what kind of suggestions you would give parents on these and here's parents rights and if you have this down you basically have what you would share with parents is their rights Okay. And I'm going to make this number uh, 13 as you bring in those basic things from here on parents' rights. And I'm just going to look at those quickly with you. Obviously a FAPE, a free appropriate public education, but they can request an evaluation of their child different from the school. And that's often forgot. They uh, have the right to be notified whenever the school wants to evaluate their child and change their placement. They have the right to be informed of consent uh, of any changes like uh, a parent's understand degree in writing. Teaching plans may withdraw their con uh, consent at any time. Did you know that? That they can withdraw their consent at any time. Nobody talks about that either. That just because they agree, they at any time they can, they can withdraw that. Again, obtain this independent evaluation of the child request a re-evaluation at any time, have their child tested in a language that a child knows best, and sometimes kids learn a disability they can't find that. Uh, I had some experience with that. Uh, this is interesting to review all the child's records in school. So be careful where you have them, what you have. State the child's IEP and be informed of their progress at least as often as the parents of the children that do not have disabilities and uh, maybe you've heard that before but that's how they at least have to be uh, informed as often as parents without disabilities and let me ask you this and I should make this uh, one also how often is that how often do you communicate progress uh, with the parents of children that don't have disabilities and I'm going to make that number 14 I'm just going to say how often and make sure you mark that well so I can see it. So that's number 14. All right. Then we're going to move on to these family systems. And this is Lavoy, who we uh, saw some of his work at the beginning of the course. A family of five is like a, fa a five people lying on a waterbed. Whenever one person moves, everyone feels the ripple. And that's what they make the case here of how. Uh, what impact uh, is to a family when a child's diagnosed as having a disability? So I am going to, uh, I'm just going to leave that here. This is the family system. That the day-to-day -day struggles of parenting a child with a disability and the impact on the entire family. And so please uh, read that.
All right. Okay. Then stages of acceptance are very interesting, and they're right here. Uh, and they say it's similar to stages of death, that it goes through the same stages. Shock, and I have that um, here. I go acceptance. I have that up here. It's the same the stages as death. Shock, disbelief, denial, anger, bargaining, and acceptance. So again, we don't, often don't give parents the, the chance to go through these stages of acceptance. Here, your child has a disability. Now its goal is make an IEP and goals and decide their future. And it really, uh, this does a nice job. So uh, this will be number 15, where you put something about each of these stages. of acceptance, acceptance of the disability. So that's uh, that's uh, that's another thing that we don't talk about in our profession enough. Then uh, this parent support groups, counseling, help parents understand, accept their child's problem. And so these things here, I'm going to make the next one. You bring those in. This is number 16, it goes right here. And I'm sorry I kind of have screwed up, but you'll you'll help me keep those uh, here. And this 14 doesn't have to be down here. That can be up here where it belongs. And that was the one, how often do you communicate with the children of the regular parent kids? Okay, and then these parent-teacher conferences. Um, that will be number 17, how to make them inviting. And one of the things that, again, they don't talk about, it's really hard sometimes uh, to get parents in that have children with disabilities because they feel like it's always such downtrodden. It's always uh, dire, uh, dire news. And I'm not quite sure how to fix that, but I know I was really frustrated when I taught in middle school. I taught in the low-income middle school. Uh, I'd sit through all the parent-teacher conference nights, and I'd see one, two at the most, of, of the families, the parents from my kids that were in my, uh, on my caseload. And it was year after year after year, it was the same. And when I'd see them the next time, say, hey, I missed you at parent teeth. They said, you know, I, I, I come for the IEP meeting. That's enough. I, I don't need to hear any more than that. And that was really shocking to me and eye-opening. And so I challenge you as our future special ed teachers or our regular teachers with special ed degrees uh, lift some of that for our, for them so it's not it doesn't feel that heavy okay and here's your chapter summary again that continuum so you have uh, 17 this time on working with these families best to you with this